Welcome to my 230th video on my work with OO Gauge. The subject of this video will be my efforts to convert a model of a Midland 440 compound locomotive for three rail operations on my Hornby 00 three rail railway. Why am I so keen on converting two rail OO Gauge locos to run three rail? Well, I'm very fond of Hornby 003 rail and have really enjoyed my work with it, but not a lot suited to the company and period of operations that I like to model was actually made by Meccano for 003 rail. I focus mainly on modeling LMS operations, as that was the company that my family worked for, so I have always sort of thought of the LMS as our railway. Actually, my grandfather, my dad's dad, started working as a cleaner for the Midland Railway sometime in the 1880s, I'd imagine. Certainly by around uh, 1910, when he married my grandmother, his second wife, he'd been left a widower with three young daughters. He was already a driver for the Midland, living in Leicester, although he started work for the Midland at its headquarters in Derby. As a driver for the Midland, he became an employee of the LMS upon amalgamation of the railways to form the Big Four in 1923. And my granddad retired as a top-line driver for the LMS sometime in the 1930s, although two of his sons continued to work for the railways. Not my dad, though. He did work for the LMS briefly, but was laid off in the difficult economic times of the 30s and had to find other work. So, given this family history, I like to focus on modelling the heyday of the LMS before the Second World War. Now, the only true LMS locomotive modelled as such for Dublo was the Duchess of Athol. And as you'll know if you've watched my previous videos, I now have four three-rail duchesses on my railway. The only other loco sold for double in LMS markings was the N2 tank engine, which is a very nice little model, but not representative of any engine that the LMS actually used. The only other LMS engine modelled for double was the Stania 8F, very much an LMS engine, but a late addition to the double range and only ever sold in BR markings. I do run the 008F in LMS markings and expect to be adding another to the mix soon. But to go beyond those models and add other LMS locos for 3 rail, it's necessary to do a little more than simple remarking. You could kit build, of course, but you'd still need to find or create suitable 3 rail chassis. Generally, the simplest way to add engines for 3 rail is to convert 2 rail models, since most of the principal LMS engines have been modelled for 2 rail in OO gauge the more prominent of them many times so. And two rail to three rail conversion, whilst it can be a bit tricky, is not generally prohibitively complex. Easier, honestly, than three rail to two rail conversion, should you want to do that, as that way round the wheel set has to be changed. The first two rail to three rail conversion to run on my double railway was this one, a Wren Royal Scott, but I didn't convert this one myself, it came to me already converted for three rail operation by someone else. I was happy to add this to the collection, as I do know that my granddad drove Royal Scott locos. Since that, I've done quite a few conversions myself, and all of them are recorded in video form on this channel. This is a Black 5, converted from a relatively modern Hornby model, coupled with a 008F tender. This is a Duck 6, an ex-Midland 4F060, converted by adding a centre rail pickup. This is a Jubilee, converted from a mainline split chassis model, with a repainted 008F tender. This is a Jinty, converted using a Marklin pickup for the centre rail. I don't believe that the LMS ever actually ran Jinty's in crimson livery, and I'm planning to fit a black body to this model at some point. This is a Princess Royal class engine, a converted Triang model, with the same repainted 008F tender as the Jubilee. And this is a streamlined Coronation class, converted with a slightly iffy centre rail pickup arrangement, but it's still running as of now. So, it's been on my agenda for quite a while now to try to convert a Midland 440 locomotive, either a 2P or a 4P, for 3 rail running. 
These were very much Midland engines and constituted a very significant part of LMS motive power, especially in the earlier years of the company, and they continued to run throughout the life of the LMS. The 4P compounds, with their external low-pressure cylinders and single internal high-pressure cylinder, were essentially the premier passenger express engines of the Midland at the time of amalgamation, and they continued to do good work for the LMS, although they weren't up to pulling large trains on the difficult western main line. I first considered trying to convert one of the two models seen here. These are both Hornby models from different decades. These are both tender-driven models, and despite quite a bit of thought, I couldn't come up with any promising ideas as to how to convert either of them for three-rail running. A centre pickup would have to be added somehow, and these models didn't seem to offer any very practical way to do that, so I rather gave up on that idea. But then my thoughts turned to this other model of a 4P that I had on hand, I'd never actually even unboxed this one, although I did have other 4Ps and 2Ps running 2-rail. Here's the end of the box showing the product info for this model. This is, by my standards, a relatively recent model released in 2014. Here's the instruction sheet for this model. Apparently with a chassis very similar, if not the same, as the Hornby models of the County, Hunt and Schools classes, which are of course all 440s. I tried the model on my test tracks. It appeared to work fine, nice and quiet and smooth and using relatively little power, as you might expect from such a modern model. This was the only thing that came with this model in the way of a detail pack, a sprue with a couple of vacuum pipes. I got this model onto the bench to have a closer look at it. As you may have seen from the instruction sheet, this model is loco-driven, DCC-ready, with an 8-pin DCC socket in the tender. I thought that this arrangement looked quite promising for the prospect of three-rail conversion. Here's the bottom of the model. As you can see, there's a drawbar screwed in place between loco and tender, and four wires pass between loco and tender. So, under normal operations, there would be no ready way of separating loco and tender. Here's a close-up of the connection. The drawbar is fixed by screws at both ends, and the four wires come out through a hole in the loco chassis and go into a hole in the tender chassis. No plug or anything of that kind is provided. The tender body was held simply by clips on the side and was quite easy to remove. Inside the tender was an 8-pin DCC socket with a blanking plate. It appeared that the four wires from the loco were soldered directly to the DCC socket. Now, the most convenient way to convert such a model for three-rail operations would, I thought, be to employ the plunger pickups for the center rail from a 008F. There was a problem with this idea. Previously, when converting a Black 5, a Jubilee, and a Princess Royal, I'd been able to simply connect the loco in question with a 008F tender, suitably remarked and repainted as necessary. The 8F tender, as seen here, was of the large Stanier type, with the high sides curved in at the top to comply with loading gauge. Tenders of this same type were also used with the Black 5, the Jubilee, and the Princess Royal classes. But the 4Ps and 2Ps were never run with tenders of that type. Several different tender types were used, but all of them were of the straight-sided type with scooped ends, quite different in appearance to the 8F tender. So I had concluded that simply coupling up an 8F tender wasn't going to be acceptable. Now, however, I thought that perhaps I could get around this issue by fitting the body of the tender that came with the 4P model to the chassis of an 8F tender given that both model tenders seem to have quite readily removable bodies. Here you can see the connection between loco and tender on a 003 rail 8F. I have undone the screw at the tender end. A single wire from the loco plugs into the front of the tender to take power from the plunger pickups in the tender to the motor in the loco. And here is that wire unplugged, just a single folded bronze connector that plugs into a square hole in the front of the tender. A single screw in the base of the tender holds on the body. I removed that screw. Here you can see the plunger pickups for the centre rail, clearly a very helpful arrangement. With that screw removed, the body lifts off the chassis. A wire from the plunger pickups is connected to a plate in the front of the tender body. 
the fibre plate with the contact for the centre rail power can simply be slid down out of its slot in the tender body, allowing body and chassis to be separated. I tried the plastic body from the 4P tender on the 8F tender chassis. It seemed to fit quite well. The width was pretty much exactly right. With the back of the body lined up with the back of the chassis, the rear of the tender looked quite sensible. The 8F tender chassis is a little longer than the body from the 4P tender, but I didn't think that this fit at the front of the tender looked violently objectionable, so I thought that this fitting might lead to a passable result. I was a bit concerned about pickup from the side rails. With the 008F, side rail pickup is only from the loco, but then that loco has eight driving wheels, providing plenty of pickup on both sides. The 4P model only had four driving wheels, and one pair was fitted with traction tyres, so really only one wheel on each side of the loco would be picking up from the side rail. The 4P model as it came was fitted with pickups on all of the tender wheels as well. Now I look for a way to provide pickup from the wheels of the 8F tender chassis. I tested the continuity between the tender wheels and the rivet holding the axle frame onto the chassis body. There was continuity there, since the double-O wheels were not insulated at all. Power was passed from the wheels to the axles and from the axles to the axle frame, if not entirely reliably. I turned my attention to the DCC socket arrangements, which I was obviously going to have to completely replace with my own appropriate arrangements. I removed the blanking plate. I tested the continuity of the blanking plate with my multimeter. The only pin explicitly numbered was 1. If we consider the pins to be numbered as shown here, then pin 1 was connected to pins 5, 6 and 2, and 8 was connected to pin 4, and either pin 3 or pin 7, I can't remember which. No wires were actually connected to pins 2, 3, 6 and 7, so the critical functional connections were between pin 1 and pin 5, and between pin 4 and pin 8. The wires from the pickups were connected to positions 4 and 5, and the wires from positions 1 and 8 would be going to the two sides of the motor. I needed to know which wires carried power from the left rail and which from the right rail. I knew from previous work with conversions that the side of the motor connected to the left rail for two rail operations needed to be connected to the centre rail for proper three rail operation, so that the model would actually move forward when the controller for three rail was set to forward. I tested continuity between the wheels of the loco and the sockets of the DCC plate. The left wheel had continuity with pin 4 so the wire connected to pin 8 would be the motor wire that I would need to connect to the centre rail pickups. The pickups from the wheels on both sides would then be connected to the other motor wire, the one on pin 1, for three rail operation. With that clarified, I proceeded to undo the screws holding on the DCC socket plate. Because wires from both loco and tender pickups were soldered to the plate, it wasn't easy to lift the plate away from the chassis. The red wire seen here is coming from the left side tender pickups. To allow me to proceed with further disassembly, I undid the screws holding on the tender base plate. With those screws removed, I was able to separate the base plate from the wheels. Although, because the wires from the loco passed through a hole in the base plate, I couldn't really separate things completely, somewhat frustratingly. Still, I did my best to pull things apart as far as they would go with the wires attached, since I needed to be able to get at the bottom of the DCC plate to desolder the wires. It's all a bit of a tangle, but you can see here how the four wires from the loco, two from pickups and two from the motor, and two wires from the tender pickups were all soldered to the DCC plate. Here's the DCC plate seen from the top in this state of disassembly. The top left and bottom right connections, four and five as previously numbered, have two wires each, one wire from loco pickups and one wire from tender pickups. The opposite pins, 1 and 8, have one wire each going to the motor. Somewhat unhelpfully, all of the wires were black, other than the wire from the left tender pickups. 
I used some red paint to mark the wire going to the motor from the left side pickups, as this was the most critical one for me, the one that needed to be connected to the centre rail pickups. The other three wires from the loco didn't need to be distinguished critically, as they were all going to be connected together to pass power from both side rails to the other side of the motor. I turned my attention to the drawbar, as I was going to want to separate tender chassis from the loco. But I couldn't do that immediately, as the wires were still going through a hole in the tender base. I got out my helping hand and my soldering station. I gripped the DCC plate in one of the clips of the helping hand and desoldered the wires from the plate connections. It was a little fiddly, but I was able to desolder all six wires, gripping first one end and then the other end of the plate in the clip. With all of those wires desoldered, I was able to set the DCC plate aside, and the ends of all of the wires were now loose. My red paint to the left side centre rail motor wire wasn't very clear, so I applied some more paint. Now I proceeded to undo the screw holding the drawbar to the loco. And then I undid the screw at the tender end of the drawbar, allowing the drawbar to be completely removed. I unthreaded the wires from the loco out of the hole in the tender base, finally allowing the loco to be completely separated from the tender parts. I reattached the tender wheels to the base plate. I wasn't going to use these parts for my three rail running, but I figured I might as well hold on to them as neatly as possible. I reattached the DCC plate and its frame to the 4P tender chassis. And then I reinstalled the blanking plate, not actually doing anything now, but just to keep things tidy. Next, I desoldered the wire from the plunger pickups on the 8F tender from its contact on the fibre plate for the front of that tender. In this case, I wasn't going to use the fibre plate and its contact. I was going to solder the wire from the plunger pickups directly to the wire going to the left side motor connection. I tried to solder a wire to the rivet holding the axle frame onto the 8F tender chassis because I wanted to connect the tender wheels to the other side of the motor to provide additional pickup from the side rails. I used some liquid flux in the attempt to make this connection. I tested the connectivity between the tender wheels and my wire soldered to the rivet. There was connectivity initially, but unfortunately the solder wouldn't hold to the rivet and just kept coming off. So I decided that since I really wanted to make this connection, I would just get rid of the rivet and replace it with a nut and bolt. I drilled out the rivet. After drilling, I used a punch to knock out the rivet. Now there was nothing connecting the axle frame to the tender chassis. I found a suitable small nut and bolt and used that to connect the axle frame to the chassis, fitting my wire under the nut on the top, so providing the necessary connection under the bolt on the top. Next, I tested the functioning of the motor. I wanted to ensure that the motor could be driven by power to the appropriate wires before proceeding to the next stage of connection for three-rail operation. By connecting my bench power supply to the wire I had marked with red as going to the left side of the motor connection, and to one of the other wires, I just experimented to determine which, I was able to operate the locomotor in both directions. Now I proceeded to solder up the wires. I soldered all three of the wires from the loco other than the red marked wire together. And then I soldered my wire from the tender chassis nut to those wires. This would provide for power from the side rails via loco and tender wheels going to one side of the motor. Then I soldered the wire from the tender plunger pickups to the red marked wire from the loco, the one going to the left side motor connection, so providing for power from the centre rail to go to that side of the motor. I tested again with my bench power supply. By applying power to the plunger pickups and to the chassis nut, I was able to operate the motor. Next I needed to provide for drawbar connection between loco and tender. 
I was able to use the original 8F drawbar. The screw at the loco end was rather small, but I was able to use it to connect that drawbar, so I didn't have to make a custom drawbar as I did for previous similar conversions. There was something of a slot in the bottom of the front of the plastic tender body, so I was able to fit the tender body without having to cut an opening for the wires. I tried the model on my three rail tracks. The good news was that the motor did operate. The bad news was that the model didn't actually move. The loco just span its wheels. I determined that the reason for this was that the rigid 8F drawbar was actually tending to lift the loco driving wheels off the track. I used two pairs of small pliers to bend the drawbar so that rather than lifting the loco wheels from the track, some of the weight of the tender actually pressed down the back of the loco a little. With that done, I was able to get the model to run round my three rail tracks. I did, however, have another problem. The front buffer beam of the loco was sticking out further to the side of the tracks than any of my other models as the loco went round curves. This resulted in the loco being unable to get round the curve in the main line if there was a train parked in the front siding, as the buffer beam of the 4P would hit the rolling stock in the siding. Basically, this resulted from a track laying error on my part. I'd let the track of the siding get progressively closer to the main line as it went from left to right, as seen here, rather than keeping the tracks parallel. I decided that I really needed to fix this. A freight train with an 8F had been sitting in the siding, and I lifted the rolling stock of that train and put it aside so that I could lift and relay the track of the siding. I undid all of the screws holding down the track of the siding, basically two screws per track section plus one for the buffer stop. I moved the track of the siding to make its straight section parallel to the main line. You can see here the line on the black base tiles where the siding was previously. The end of the straight section just got moved over about half an inch towards the end of the board. I screwed the track for the siding down in its new position and then tested with the N2 to make sure that the siding still had proper electrical continuity for its whole length. Now the 4P was able to get round the curve without hitting the rolling stock in the siding. You can see here how the front buffer beam of the 4P sticks out quite away as the loco goes round the curve but now the siding is far enough away that this isn't a problem. I also had to move the footbridge in the back left corner of the tabletop as the 4P was hitting that as it went round the curve, as the bridge was originally placed. So now I was basically able to run the 4P all round my three rail tracks. I hadn't really done anything about holding the tender body on. I tried using some tack. That didn't work very well. I ended up using a couple of dabs of glue. It should be easy enough to separate the body in future if necessary. Finally, I decided I might as well fit one of the vacuum pipes provided to the front buffer beam. There was a little hole in the buffer beam where the pipe was obviously supposed to go. I glued the pipe in place with a little CA. Here's the 4P model as set up for three rail running, together with the reassembled parts of the original tender, which I put back into the model's box. And here is the 4P back on my 003 rail tracks. So now I'll finish with a little running video of this converted model. So let me see if I can just try to show you some running video of this 440 4P compound that I've converted for three rail running. I believe it should run now, but, you know, of course it's a modern model. It's fairly lightweight. It's got traction tires on two of its driving wheels, fairly small flanges on the wheels. So it's not really very well geared to running on the double O track. And it's apt to have some problems, especially going over the points, but we'll see what we can do. Runs quietly enough with relatively little power because it's got a modern motor in it. It's just not got a lot of weight is the problem. This point is the biggest problem there, and we got over it. But that point too, you see it hesitates over the points because it's struggling a bit 
to keep its power up and now it's stopped see and that's because I'm trying to I'm trying to run it slowly and uh, whoops, sorry I had put the uh, control I've used it running the gauge master controller here and I put the controller down on the track so I had to grab it before the engine ran into it but as you can see it's running fairly smoothly I'm a bit worried about whether that bogey is going to derail on points because it doesn't have much weight in the past I've ended up changing the wheels on the bogeys of uh, locos I've converted double wheels on them to improve their chances of getting over the double points I have had this one derail on points, specifically that point, but it's got over it a couple of times now, so we'll see. Oh, but it's now it's stopped on that one again. Oh, I'm going to put the controller down where it's not on the tracks. It's, this is a contact problem, you know, it's just, it, it just needs edging forward a millimetre or two. It's those, um... I think it's the third rail contacts, those plunger contacts in the pickup, in the um, tender. Cheated there, I gave it a bit more power to get it over there. But that's a dangerous thing in itself because it can cause it to derail, jerking the power up. But uh, well. So there you go for now, That'll, that's all we're going to get I think for now. I'm not sure. I don't think I'm even going to try and hook this up to carriages at the moment. I doubt it's going to have much pulling power, because although it has traction tyres, it's really lightweight. It was a ha I had to adjust the um, the drawbar to make sure that the weight of the tender was actually pushing the loco wheels down rather than lifting them up to get it to move at all. When I first tried it, it just spun its wheels and didn't move at all. So it's not the what you'd exactly call a great runner, but on the other hand, I'm fairly pleased to have been able to make the conversion.